title of this webinar today is We Don't Need a Better Rat Trap, Reconceptualizing Municipal Rat Management. Um, my name is Mike Lee. I'm currently an environmental epidemiologist with uh, Environmental Health Services at the BC CDC. Um, but this work was done as a part of my PhD at UBC. And I did this work with a group called the, the Vancouver Rat Project and the BC node of the Canadian Wildlife Health Cooperative. Uh, and importantly, this work was funded by the, the city of Vancouver in search of suitable rat management protocols in their city. And speaking of rats in Vancouver, this, this video here on the right shows um, some rats that I saw enjoying themselves in a community garden somewhere in downtown Vancouver. And the best part is when they come climbing out of the dumpster here at the end. So I thought I'd start quickly by giving my territorial acknowledgement and just saying that I, I gratefully acknowledge that I live and work on the traditional and unceded territory of the Katsi First Nation. Um, and this is a picture taken from the top of Golden Ears Peak a few weeks ago overlooking Pitt Lake. And you can see that it really is a beautiful part of the province and an, indeed a beautiful part of the entire country. So to begin this presentation on rats, I thought I would start by first addressing the, the elephant or, or rather the rat in the room and answering the question, why, why municipal rat problems? Why in the context of all of the existential issues that we seem to be facing today, things like climate change, hurricanes, um, housing crises, why should we be talking about urban rat problems in a webinar like this? Well, as you can see from, from this map, Urban rats have a near global distribution, such that if you go to almost any major metropolitan area in the world, you can expect those cities to be dealing with their own rat problems. So it really is a global problem. And within those cities, rats are problematic for a number of key reasons. And when most people think about rats and the problems they cause, I think most people tend to think about zoonotic pathogens or, or the pathogens that can spread from rats into the human population. And rats are most famously associated with, with a disease called the plague or the Black Death. And this disease is caused by a bacteria called Yersinia pestis, which is still around today and causes outbreaks in different parts of the world. But this was famously associated with, with big pandemics and epidemics of the 13th and 14th century. And it even killed about a quarter of the entire European population in the 14th century. But what some people might not know is that rats today also carry a variety of different zoonotic diseases. And the Vancouver Rat Project for, for more than a decade now has been working in Vancouver to understand the ecology and epidemiology of uh, various pathogens carried by rats, specifically in the downtown east side, so a particular neighborhood in Vancouver. And here's a picture of, of myself and my colleague at the time, Kaylee Byers, uh, sampling some rats in our, our roaming rat laboratory van, van that we, we originally bought off Craigslist and then converted into to what you see here. Um, and here I've sampled this rat's blood and we found that rats were able to carry bacteria in the genus Bartonella uh, and species within this genus can cause a disease in people called cat scratch disease. In the back here, Kaylee is doing some of the glory work and she's actually collecting urine from, from the rat that you can see in the cage there. And we found that rats in, in this neighborhood are able to carry a bacteria called Leptospira enterogens, and they shed this bacteria in their urine and it can spread between rats that way and to other animals and even people. But beyond those two pathogens, we found that rats in this one neighborhood were able to carry a variety of different zoonotic pathogens, including methicillin-resistant Staphylococcus aureus, antibiotic-resistant E. coli, salmonella species, Clostridium difficile, and even hepatitis E virus. And just to give you a little bit of a, a disease ecology lesson about rats, we tend to think of rats as a sort of pathogen sponge where they're able to, to soak up and carry whatever pathogens are present in their particular environment and have little to no negative impacts on the health of the rat. And so this is important because rats in a neighborhood like the downtown east side might have a completely different pathogen profile from rats that live in a neighborhood in another part of the same city. But beyond the risk of zoonotic pathogens, rats are also problematic for a number of other key reasons. So for example, 
When rats get inside buildings, they can raise the level of indoor allergens associated with things like increased asthma morbidity. Their presence can adversely affect mental health, especially when they're in people's living environments. They can cause significant property and infrastructure damages. Here, here's a picture of a, a rat that died chewing on the wires in my old car when we were doing that, that rat work in the downtown east side. Um, but they can also cause a variety of other damages by burrowing under streets and sidewalks, causing them to collapse and even causing structural fires by chewing on, on wires and buildings. Their presence can, can decrease utilization of public spaces. Here you can see a, a beautiful wedding garden with some, some massive rat holes in the background. And you can imagine that not many people wanna come here to take their, their wedding photos anymore. Um, they can also damage business reputations, particularly food establishments, and they can contaminate and consume foodstuffs. Now, urban rat problems are really the quintessential urban problem. And it's kind of an ancient problem in that for as long as people have lived in cities, people have been trying to control rats in those places. And so to give you a bit of an idea of how long we've been doing this, the main species of urban rats today, the brown rat began to spread globally with people through the 800s into the 1800s, giving them their global distribution that they have today. And there's even evidence of a rat-proof granary or a, a food storage facility in the form of archeological evidence from 13 BC in Rome. And you can see here, uh, a picture of a, a very happy uh, rat patrol hunter uh, crawling around the sewers in the early 1900s in Europe. So urban rat management is not a new concept, but despite ongoing management for many, many years, and despite the fact that it's ongoing in many cities today, rats do appear to be thriving around the world. And we can see that they're thriving through um, various pieces of evidence. For example, anybody who's lived in a major metropolitan area can probably anecdotally attest to the fact that there are rat problems there. We can see periodic news reports from journalists uh, reporting infested neighborhoods in overrun cities. And we can see reports like this from, from national pest control companies. Here, Orkin is reporting that on their list, Chicago has been the rattiest city for six years in a row in the USA, despite the fact that Chicago does have a municipal rat program in place. So although municipal rat management appears to be ubiquitous in cities around the world, there's actually a fairly limited understanding of why, how, or even if management is failing and whether those management failures are the reason that we see rats persisting in cities around the world. So it's in the context of this uncertainty that, that we started thinking about this research. And we really wanted to know, you know, what is the current state of municipal rat management? What's working, what's not working and why? And so our specific research question for this, this work was, what are the characteristics, strengths, weaknesses, and barriers and opportunities associated with the theory and practice of municipal rat management? And can we take that information and provide some, some specific recommendations to help municipalities in the design and improvement of their own municipal rat management strategies? So to answer this research question, we used what's called data triangulation. And data triangulation is simply looking at the research question from the perspectives of different data sources with the idea that by, by bringing everything together, we could get a more nuanced and complete picture of the current state of municipal rat management. So in this work, we looked at the municipal rat management literature, the perceptions and opinions of municipal rat management stakeholders, and we did a review of municipal rat management programs and regulations. And so I've, I've organized the remainder of these slides around the analytical steps of data triangulation, and I've color-coded the background of the slides accordingly, so that if you ever get lost where I am in this talk, you can just look at the color and what it says on the bottom to remind yourself where in this data triangulation we are. So just quickly, the, the steps of data triangulation involve first qualitatively analyzing data from each source then comparing key themes across those sources before exploring and describing any ideas and themes that emerged from making that comparison across these data sources. And then finally, and perhaps most importantly, we wanted to draw some conclusions and make some recommendations relevant to our original research question. 
So with that, I'll move on to, to the first step of data triangulation, which was to qualitatively analyze data from each source. The first, the first source of data that we looked at was the, the opinions and perceptions of municipal rat management stakeholders. So this study, which was recently published in the Journal of Urban Ecology, was called Stakeholder Perspectives on the Development and Implementation of Approaches to Municipal Rat Management. So in this study, we spoke with a variety of stakeholders in municipal rat management uh, programs from different cities. Um, so we spoke with people like municipal rat management program directors, pest management professionals who worked privately but held contracts with the city. We spoke with public health veterinarians, food program inspectors, et cetera, et cetera. And a key finding from, from this work was that these individuals felt that municipal rat management really is an essential service that cities need to be providing. And it's essential for all the reasons that I listed at the beginning of this presentation. But most of these stakeholders felt that this was a really complicated problem for which nobody historically or, or currently has ever been able to come up with an ultimate solution for. So next we looked at municipal programs and regulations or policies in place in different cities. So this work, was, which was very recently published in the Journal of Urban Affairs is titled, Municipal Urban Rat Management Policies and Programming in Seven Cities in the United States of America. So for this work, I actually traveled around to these seven different cities and I, I met with key program employees to discuss how their program was structured, what, what they were supposed to do, and I actually went in the field with them to see what was working and what wasn't working. And I, I combined this with, with an in-depth review of the legislation or bylaws in place in these cities that were regarding the management of rat problems. So a key finding from this work is that these programs and policies were ultimately designed to reduce rats at as cross, across as large a scale as possible. And interestingly, the program served as a sort of brain for the overall municipal approach, able to adapt and expand the city's approach towards rats, while the regulation served as a sort of scaffold for management, providing a baseline structure for action. Next, we looked at the municipal rat management literature. And, and this study was published in Frontiers in Ecology and Evolution. Uh, and it's titled Reconsidering the War on Rats, What We Know from Over a Century of Research into Municipal Rat Management. So in this study, we tried to get as much literature on municipal rat management as we could. And it ended up being the most comprehensive literature review that's ever been done on municipal rat management. So, we looked in various sources of the peer-reviewed and non-peer-reviewed literature, and we went back as far and far in time as we as we could. And the key finding from from this work was that there has been very little change in the municipal approach to rat management since the early 1900s. And, and this finding was so profound that I could probably take one of the earliest studies in, in this review from, from 1909. I could change a few key examples and I could probably publish that paper today and experts in the field would say, yes, you know, that's what we should be aiming for and, and that's what cities are missing. And despite the fact that there has been so little change over the last, the last century, we found that there were few to no examples of cities actually successfully meeting their own pre-specified rat reduction objectives. So that brings us to step two, which was to compare key themes across data sources. And really the overarching theme across all of this work was that there was an entrenched war on rats paradigm driving municipal rat management. And it was driving the way that research was done. It drove the structure and function of the, the programs and regulations that I looked at. And it served as the basis for the opinions of the stakeholders that I spoke with. So what is this war on rats paradigm? Well, it's simply a view of what management should be and how it should be carried out. So the, the war on rats view of management is that management is the need to reduce rats at as large a scale as possible and for as long as possible. And the way that, that experts felt um, was the best way to 
uh, carry out this war on rats was by using what's called integrated pest management or IPM at a large scale. So IPM are the, the best practice management methods at the property level, and it involves uh, all of the lethal control measures at your disposal, so rodenticide, kill trapping, but then combining that with trying to reduce the food, water, and harborage sources that rats are using to survive, and then monitoring your impact on that rat population over time. And the main innovation with scaling that to the municipal level has simply been to try and do those, those property level tactics at as many properties across the city as you can, and for as long as you can. And you can see stakeholder three here really capturing the essence of this war, which was, you know, the goal should be eradication. Now, although this war on rats paradigm was entrenched, we found that there was limited evidence supporting the idea that this war actually enabled approaches that effectively met its own objectives. And as I said earlier, the most important piece here is that we found a lack of quantitative evidence demonstrating that these war on rats approaches could be successful. So in over 100 years of literature, we saw no clear success stories. And you can see Meyer here in his seminal paper on, on rat management in 1999, capturing the disappointment that was so prevalent in the literature with municipalities' ability to manage rat problems. And so he says, perhaps one of the most disappointing aspects of rodent control over the last 30 years is the failure of governments to address this collective problem in a collective way. And so this disappointment has persisted in the literature for, for many, many years, and it's still present today. And then very importantly for the rest of the presentation, we found that this war was a low priority problem within the context of all of the other issues municipalities were, were facing. And because it was a relatively low priority problem, it received perpetually low levels of resource investment so that one of the most common barriers that these approaches faced was low levels of resource investment and an inability to take action to manage rats at the scales that they felt was necessary. And here you can see stakeholder number four who worked in the city operations department talking about how rats compared to other issues in their city. So uh, stakeholder four says, Rat management is not going to be the highest priority for us, you know, making sure that roads are paved and making sure that people have the infrastructure they need to live their day to day lives is always going to be a higher priority for street sanitation, you know, trash collection, things like this. And so what this stakeholder is capturing here is that within cities. Um, municipalities have so many issues that they're dealing with, you know, affordable housing, paving streets, removing snow, making sure trash is collected, that rats compared to those issues just really fall low on the overall priority list. And we're starting to see in, in, in uh, research that's paralleling this work that municipal residents appear to also not care about rats directly. They, they tend to care more about the context in which they're interacting with rats. So if, if you live in a neighborhood that has a rat infestation because the, the neighborhood is disordered and has waste management problems, people tend more to care about those, those larger neighborhood context problems. And the rats are really seen as a symptom of that, that overall issue. And then finally, we found that this war really only addresses one small component of a much more complex system. So I'll walk you through what I mean here. The, the focus of this war on rats approach is directly and myopically on the rats. So the way that these approaches work is that they send inspectors into the field, the inspectors identify where the rat problems are, and then they use the majority of their resources to try and reduce those rat populations through lethal control measures. And with what resources they have left over, they try and reduce those, those food, water, and harborage causes that they can identify around that rat problem. And what we found is that these approaches are almost always inhibited by barriers outside of that rat level focus. So for example, the most common barrier that came up time and time again was an inability of these war and rats approaches to affect change over the residents' behaviors contributing to these food, water, and harborage causes. And the reason these war on rats approaches aren't able to deal with these, these issues like resident behavior change is because they're designed to reduce rats and they don't have the expertise to do these, these more complicated um, 
management problems like managing resident behaviors. And as you start to zoom out, you can see that there are more and more upstream determinants of, of these rat populations. And if you keep zooming out, you might eventually find yourself at a place like this, where, where it becomes apparent that rats are really just one small symptom of a much wider and more complex set of interacting upstream and downstream determinants of the rat problems. And when you start thinking about the, the rat problem this way, and you see that rats are being caused by uh, problems with parks, um, municipal policy issues, commercial, establish commercial establishment issues, landscaping problems, people not cleaning up after their pets, and you compare that to the original focus of the war, which was, which was directly on the rats, you can see that when we're, when we're trying to reduce these rat populations directly and ignoring this, this wider system, that the war is likely something that we're never going to win. Um, and for example, if, if you want to get rid of rats within this war on rats paradigm, you'll also have to solve things like urban deterioration, neglect, and disorder. And clearly, urban deterioration, neglect, and disorder is not an ultimately solvable problem. And if you can't solve that problem, all of the conditions that continue to produce rats will continue to thrive in these areas. So that brings us to step three of the data triangulation, which was to explore and describe any ideas that emerged from looking at these different data sources. And really the, the key idea that emerged from, from comparing across these data sources was that municipal rat problems appear to be aligned with a group of problems called wicked problems. Now, that's a cool name, but, but what exactly are our wicked problems? This is a class of problems first labeled and identified as such by two urban planners in 1973, Riddle and Weber. And in their, their work on wicked problems, they outlined two broad classes of problems. The first class, which they called tame problems, was reserved for problems that were immediately definable and had an ultimate right or wrong solution. So for example, a tame problem to Riddle and Weber was a, a math problem in a textbook. The other class of problems, which they called wicked problems, were reserved for those problems that were so complicated that it was almost impossible to specifically identify exactly what the problem was because it existed in these, these big messes of interacting problems and everybody's view of what the problem was depended upon their experience with that problem in this wider system. And so in their paper, Riddle and Weber outlined 10 defining criteria that they felt made these problems unsolvable or intractable. And what I did in this research is I compared municipal rat management to these 10 criteria to ask myself, okay, well, is municipal rat management a wicked problem? And to give you an example, uh, one of those criteria is that solutions to wicked problems are not right or wrong, they're not yes or no, rather they're, they're good or bad, or they're better and wor or worse. And so here are three examples of three different approaches to municipal rat management, a good, bad, and very bad approach. So starting with the, the good approach to municipal rat management, we might have something like this, a, a rat-proof garbage container. And this is good because not only does it reduce the, the main food source available to rats, but it might also reduce other negative human wildlife interactions that result from improperly stored garbage, you know, things with like coyotes, uh, raccoons, crows, um, and it will make the neighborhood an overall more inviting place in which to live. A potentially very a potentially bad approach to municipal rat management is the widespread application of rodenticide bait. And this is problematic and bad for a number of key reasons, chief among which include that when rats consume this poison and then get consumed by, by another animal, such as a bird of prey like an owl, that other animal can also die from exposure to this rodenticide. And then we have potentially very bad approaches to municipal rat management. And this is a paper that I published in 2018 examining the, the impacts of traditional kill trapping methods on the prevalence of different zoonotic pathogens carried by rat populations. And we found that the, the disruption that this kill trapping caused within the rat population um, 
actually increased the prevalence of the, the zoonotic pathogen leptospira and tyrigans that we were studying. And so this is, is clearly a very bad approach to try and manage rats. And so I go on to show that, yes, indeed, municipal rat problems and municipal rat management does indeed appear to meet all 10 wicked problem criteria. But rather than go through these in, in any detail, there were two key features or two key ideas that arose from, from reconceptualizing municipal rat management as a wicked problem. So first of all, viewing this problem through this lens highlights that there really is no singular definition of what constitutes a municipal rat problem. And because there's no singular definition of what constitutes a municipal rat problem, there's no ultimate solution that addresses the problem for all stakeholders across the city. So let me give you a more concrete example of, of what I mean here. Consider two differing contexts in which people interact with rats. So we have two neighborhoods here, one on the left, one on the right. The neighborhood on the left is a deteriorating, neglected and disordered neighborhood. And the, the neighborhood on the right is a historical tourist destination neighborhood that's, that's relatively very clean. And now, because of rats' ability to be to adapt to almost any resource, and really, for lack of a better word, because they're so awesome, both of these neighborhoods had extremely bad rat problems. But if you live in the first neighborhood, this disordered neighborhood, it's, it's likely that you view rats as just one part of the overall disorder and neglect of your neighborhood. And if you live here, you might think it's crazy for the city to even even consider coming into your neighborhood and spending tons of resources on trying to deal with the rat problem before they deal with the overall deterioration and neglect of the area. In contrast, if you live in this historical tourist destination neighborhood, rats might actually threaten the historical integrity of these buildings. And so for people living here, it might be extremely important to use spare no cost uh, rodent control measures to constantly keep them at low levels over time. So, so that's great. What have I said? Um, municipal rat problems are these, these big complex problems and we're trying to address them as if they're a simple problem. And people's view of the problem shifts depending on where they interact within the urban ecosystem. So what now? What can we actually take from this and make actionable for municipalities in the design of their own um, municipal rat management approaches. So first, I'll walk us through how shifting the perspective from the war on rats approach to the wicked problem approach can change how we in cities approach this ubiquitous problem. So the war on rats approach conceptualizes this as a singular issue. It is the presence of rats that's a problem. The wicked problem approach understands that there are these different problem definitions depending upon people's view of the problem in these urban environments. Because of this view of, of the problem as a, as a single issue, the war on rats approach conceptualizes this as a solvable problem. You know, if we, if we put enough resources towards this issue, we will be able to, to get rid of the rats. The wicked problem approach understands that there probably isn't an ultimate solution that addresses the problem as it exists for all of these different stakeholders. The war on rats approach understands that this is a complex problem like the stakeholders talked about um, in step one of the data triangulation, but the complexity is conceptualized as a set of food, water, and harborage causes of rats across the urban environment that can each be identified and eliminated one by one by one. The Wicked Problem approach thinks of this complexity in a more nuanced way, and it thinks that this system is comprised of a, a complex open system, so a system comprised of different systems that are interacting with one another. And because of this view of, of the complexity of the problem, the war on rats approach does not account for these varying perspectives of the problem, while the wicked problem approach specifically tries to account for these shifting perspectives and priorities of this issue. And because the war on rats approach isn't addressing the priorities with regard to this problem as it exists for the stakeholders in this issue, 
it becomes a low priority program and it receives these perpetually low levels of resource investments from the city and taxpayers. In contrast, the wicked problem approach says that we need to account for these, these shifting stakeholder priorities. And in doing so, hopefully we design a program that is actually addressing issues that are a priority for the stakeholders involved. And as a result, won't receive these low levels of resource investments. So we need to reconceptualize the problem to, to focus on this issue as a part of these big complex systems. And thinking about it as a complex system highlights the need to refocus on the interfaces between people and rats rather than directly on the rats themselves. So these interfaces are, are those environments or those contexts that promote rat-human contact or negative rat-human contact. So I'll give a very specific example of, of what I mean here by focusing on the interfaces rather than the rats. So let's consider one small part of this overall municipal rat problem environment. And let's consider sewer rats. And you can see here, this is a, a poor little sewer rat who got stuck trying to crawl out of a, a manhole cover. Within the war on rats approach, rats and sewers are, are viewed as a problem simply because they are present there. And because of that view of them as a problem, the only thing that's ever been done to try and control sewer rats is to persistently hang rodenticide from manhole covers into these sewers. And that's problematic because a lot of this rodenticide, the rodenticide that doesn't get consumed or, or gets consumed in rats and then decomposes with that rat's body, will eventually get washed away with wastewater and it can accumulate in aquatic species like fish. In contrast, the interface approach here would first say, okay, sewer rats, that's, that's great. Well, is there even an interface between sewer rats and people? Do people at the surface actually get negatively impacted by sewer rats? And because we've, we've focused on this war and rats approach, there's actually very little known about the ecology of sewer rats and whether there is significant interfaces between, between people and sewer rats. So if we start asking these questions and we start doing this research, we might find that, well, no, actually sewer rats spend most of their life in the sewer and they don't ever actually impact people. And if we find that to be the case, then perhaps we'll consider their presence in sewers to be acceptable. And if we start thinking about them not just as a pest, we might find that their, their presence in sewers is actually associated with significant benefits, like consuming excess waste in, in our sewers and preventing it from, from running off with wastewater. On the flip side, uh, a lot of experts do think that sewer rats have an important interface with people. And one of those important interfaces is rats' ability to, to burrow out of sewers, um, excavate the soil around them, and cause not only the collapse of the sewer, but eventually the street and sidewalk above. So if, if, if we do this research and we find that to be the case, the interface approach would, would start by saying, okay, well, where are these interfaces occurring? How are they occurring? And how can we modify them to prevent them from occurring in the future? And so, <clears throat> excuse me, it's likely that if we do this research, we'll find that rats' ability to burrow out of sewers is associated with things like the sewer construction materials and how often they're maintained. For example, maybe rats are only able to burrow outside of uh, old brick sewers or old stone sewers, but they're not able to burrow outside of um, iron sewers or, or reinforced concrete sewers. And as a spinoff from this work, the Vancouver Rat Project has actually started doing this research. Um, and this is a paper published by my colleague, Maggie. Um, and in this paper, she did this great analysis looking at the characteristics of the urban sewer system associated with rat presence in Seattle. And indeed, she, she's begun to find that rats are only living in sewers with certain features like um, brick construction, for example. So that's great. We need to address these interfaces between people and rats. 
But when we think about wicked problems again, we have to remember that um, we're addressing these interfaces in the context of these big complex systems, this, this complex system that I showed earlier. And a common criticism of the wicked problem literature is that looking at this overwhelming number of interfaces can leave the manager with what's figuratively called wicked bad paralysis or the tendency to throw their hands up in the air and go, well, I mean, what's the point of doing anything in the context of all of these upstream determinants of the RAP problems? And in addition to the overwhelming number of interfaces, each of those interfaces might be its own highly complex wicked problem with no clear solution. So if the interface is urban deterioration, neglect, and disorder, that's another wicked problem that is going to be extremely hard to affect change over. And so what we wanted to do with this research was, was to give municipalities a really concrete set of steps that they could take um, if they want to apply this interface approach. And this is just one option for, for acting within this wicked problem world. So this is, this is a simple diagram that I'll walk us through. Um, and we'll start on the left with that overwhelming number of interfaces that I was talking about. And so the, the first thing that a city needs to do with this overwhelming number of interfaces is they need to prioritize which interfaces they're actually going to try and affect change over because there's not enough resources in the world for any municipality to deal with all of those upstream determinants of rats. So they need to choose which interfaces they actually want to act upon. And there are two key pieces of information that cities or municipalities can use to try and prioritize those interfaces. Most importantly, our stakeholder priorities. So um, talking with municipal residents, looking at why people are complaining about rats to understand what interfaces in our cities people actually care about and want the city to deal with. That'll make sure that, that these approaches um, are, are a high priority problem for these municipalities. And that can be combined with a, a conceptualization of what I've called here um, maximizing the systemic benefits. And that simply means looking at the management of these interfaces beyond just the context of dealing with rats. So if the interface we want to manage is, say, um, poorly managed rental properties in which landlords uh, are not helping renters deal with, with an unsecure and unsafe living environment that also allows rats to persist, um, if we are able to affect change over that interface and give people a more safe and secure environment in which to live, that'll have many benefits beyond just reducing negative rat-human interactions. For example, people might feel more safe in their homes and build more resilience to deal with other issues in their lives. And then finally, once we've prioritized the interface, we've chosen an interface that we, we actually want to act upon, that interface might be its own important or complex wicked problem. And one of the ways that you can affect change over this interface is using what's called incremental muddling through. And that sounds like a, a whole lot of jargon. So to use an American metaphor here, uh, apologies in advance, it's using a silver buckshot approach as opposed to a silver bullet approach. So the silver bullet is something we're all familiar with and it's what we've been trying to do within the war on the rats. It's trying to come up with that single ultimate solution to this problem that'll make everything better. In contrast, the silver buckshot approach is making many small feasible changes across the many upstream determinants of the interface that you're acting upon. And together, those many small changes can have a relatively large impact on the interface. And the idea with the incremental muddling through is that many of those changes are not gonna work, some of them are. And so what you have to do is accept the fact that you're never going to come up with an ultimate solution. And instead, you're just going to have to keep identifying what's working and what's not working and slowly making changes upon your changes over time. So I'll, I'll wrap things up now. Um, and, and what did we learn in this research? Well, we learned that, yes, indeed, urban rats are, are a problem that, that do need to be managed for all of those reasons, those, the diseases they harbor, mental health issues. 
And it's clear that the current approach is not quite working, that rats are thriving around the world. And the reason that it's not working is because these approaches, this war on rats approach is too myopic. It's too focused on rats. And so we propose that what the, the, the way forward here is to first recognize that municipal rat problems are unsolvable because they are part of these big complex systems. And only by not trying to solve that problem can we actually start to make a little bit of progress forward over time. So I'll, I'll open things up to questions and I just wanna say thank you to the, the research team here and also my uh, cat Tusk who, who came on some, some rat safaris with us in the downtown east side.